Hello, uh, this is Robert Stark. I am uh, joined here with uh, Paul Bingham. Uh, Paul, great having you back on. Uh, good to be back on, Robert. How are you doing this evening? Uh, great. So, Paul, uh, as an engine, how was your Thanksgiving? It was the same Thanksgiving as I always have. I drunk a lot of fire water and lay in front of a fire <laughs> and uh, gave up alcohol again, as I do every year about this time. It's a family tradition. <laughs> You give up alcohol the last month of the year, or you drink heavily like yeah, the first half of the year? I drink heavily, and I drink heavily, and then I give up alcohol. So it was like your last month, like one massive month-long hangover. It's one. Uh, I don't get bad hangovers uh, right now. I'm a little bit hungover. I'm as hungover as I ever get. But I'm a very, um, I'm a very contented drinker. You know, but uh, the hangover is a little bit annoying, so I'm going to probably run run down the railroad tracks in the rain after this <laughs> after this broadcast is over. I'm going to get run over by a train or something, but my death train is going to come along, so and run me over. But then kind I'll feel like better, in, you know. Kind of like in your book. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I'm not, uh, you know, everything that happens in the book is something that I've seen happen to somebody else or that's happened to me, or something I've, that's going to happen to me. You know? So the book is called Black House Rocked, and I interviewed uh, your friend and co-writer, Emerald Kressel, about the book, but you weren't able to make it. No, I was, uh, I was dealing with life's uh, problems at the time, and uh, like I said, I've, uh, I've worked my way out of the bottle, and right now I'm in the bottleneck, and I'm about to climb out of the bottle. So this is like a coming coming back uh coming back broadcast. Back to so writing, I, back to life. I already pretty much summarized the book for people who are interested in uh, listening to that, they can check out the archives, but I'm interested in some of the influences uh for well first of all, the main character he's falsely accused of buggery of young boys. Is that based on a true story of someone you know? Yeah, he's uh, he's either either still in jail or uh, or uh, he's out. And I honestly haven't uh, gone too deeply into trying to find out what happened to him. But I always assumed his innocence because you know I was uh, I was a good friend of his and. Uh, I'm pretty sure he was innocent, but, um, you know, he it is based on a very real character, yeah. So the character, just that aspect of the character is mostly based on him? No, uh, you know, if things had worked out differently and, uh, you know, he could have been and done the things that the character does in the book, but... You know, things don't always work out. You know, I think Mark Twain said once in his book uh, where uh, the individual goes to heaven <clears throat> and he finds out that the greatest general who ever lived was a butcher. And he never found out that he was the greatest general who ever lived because he never got the chance to be anything but a butcher. You know, so had the protagonist or the the inspiration for the protagonist of Black House Rock gotten the opportunities to do the things that the protagonist does in the book, he might well have done them, but he never got that opportunity. You have a great quote from that book. Uh, it says, when a society kills a person, they don't necessarily die for years. Yeah. I don't know where that came from. It just come out, you know. Yeah, I don't... So that book... That book was written under the influence of demons, so I don't know exactly. You know, these things just come to you. There was remember there's a scene in the book when the main character uh, gets to jail and the other uh, sex offenders give him a hard time for being a homosexual uh, predator rather than a heterosexual predator. Is that also inspired by a true story? Well, the the original story is very true. As a matter of fact, the story about the little girl is about as true as Truman Capote's uh, 
in cold blood because I've changed some details, but it's a very real story about a little girl that was murdered not too far from where I live. And the de- some details have been changed, but the gist of the story is, uh, is in fact, uh, you know, that's correct. So what I did was I compounded two cases of child molestation together to make this story, but they are both based on real events. And the book covers a lot of uh, cultural and political themes. There is kind of the theme of the main character, how he's at the absolute bottom of society, but there's also the themes of how the society has changed, like the small town has been uh, economically decimated, and re- I think it was replaced like by a Walmart, so it's inspired by political trends. Then there's also this like a vigilante character who's a white nationalist, and he's trying to assassinate a politician. Well, I don't know what he is. He is he's a very strange person. But getting back to the original concept, what most small towns are about a hundred years ago the Fabians came up with the concept of commuter towns in which the middle classes would commute to a bigger town and be able to return to their garden city paradise in the suburbs. And this was the socialist dream. People don't understand. Uh, Ernest Sadler and individuals like that had this idea for the commuter town. You you took the train to town or you, you went to town somehow to the big city and you worked your job and then you came back to the little little country town where you lived and this is why most towns are basically they're just bedroom communities they you know they don't have any life or culture or texture of their own it's just place where people come home at night and go to sleep and watch tv and eat sometimes and they're lifeless they have no life of their own you know Um, there's no uh, there are no scenes no uh, people walking the streets there's no there's no life to that those communities any longer and so this is the kind of community that stories don't come out of. And honestly, uh, I found it a, a great hardship to wring stories out of writing. You know, you mentioned the white nationalist character. He is a white nationalist. He's also a vampire or some weird creature. You know, he's a watcher. In well, there's also which... the vampire in uh, Emerald's story, which Emerald's story is more like, it's like a poem, but it's about a vampire uh, Salvatore, who lived during the Crusades. Yeah, and uh, we realized that we were inadvertently writing about the same people before we'd ever met. And like I said, I considered him an angel, but then, you know, things change and you start want- questioning whether you're writing about an angel or a demon or something. But he is some extra, you know, paranormal creature. And... Uh, some unique, you know, person, but where I'm going with this is, like I said, I found it very difficult to write about uh, white people any longer because their lives are so dull and empty, and you know, the last uh, few months I've gone through the South, and I found much a more rich, much richer oral tradition among blacks because the black man has been more or less neglected by the Jews, and they've reverted to their organic state so uh, the white man is more directly under Jewish influence whereas the black man has been used for what he's been used for over the past 50 years and now he's he's back to his normal form so what I'm getting at is that I had to work very hard to bring a story out of this whole deal and I had to pick a character a very poor character, you know, uh, what they call white trash, to find any life or any story behind it. And I had to pick, I had to pick two different themes. I had to pick a person who is white but more than human or less than human, and I had to pick a, you know, somebody who would be considered white trash. And I had to put them to together to create this story, you know, because I can't find anything in the average white person that's worth writing about. Uh, that speaks to the sterility of white culture. 
I know some people sort of fetishize like a uh, flyover country. They say people in uh, like uh, California and New York are decadent, but the people in the heartland are like real people. But you don't necessarily, that's way too simplistic to look at it. It's basically, you're talking about the whole country. Well, the uh, the Midwest is, uh, I've been all over this country just recently, as a matter of fact, and, you know, there's certain stereotypes that are more true than others. People are pretty much bad, badly behaved in the Northwest, in the Northeast, rather, and people are generally more friendly in the South. They're just more personable doing business or going through, driving a truck through the South. It's People are just more friendly and decent in the, in Georgia than they are in New York, New York, New Jersey, Pennsylvania. Um, well, my impression of California is that people are neither, they're not super friendly, but at the same time they're not confrontational either. Yeah, I would agree with that, your assessment. But insofar as culturally speaking or morally speaking, I think everybody is under the, is equally under the same sway of the television. And the television dictates culture in this country. Everybody watches the same shows, be they in in New York or California or flyover country, Midwest, Arkansas, Kansas, Iowa. And the television sets their morality, their culture. You know, certain people will watch CMT and, you know, but CMT is, probably as decadent as, uh, you know, a lot of, as the Kardashians or anything else, just in a different way. So I don't see any reason to fetishize the culture of the Midwest because it's really not there, you know? I forget who wrote this article. Oh, I think it was Richard Spencer. Uh, He wrote an article about Christian Hollywood, and he basically said it's basically like the mainstream Hollywood, but without uh, swearing and and less sex. Well, Richard Spencer is, uh, could call his uh, memoirs like Albert J. Nock, Memoirs of a Superfluous Man, because he writes about superfluous topics. And, you know, I, I would love to get paid to write about super- superfluous topics, but I think I'd get bored after a while. But in any case, you have Kevin Sorbo, and you have uh, oh, one of those, Stephen Baldwin, and you know, Stephen Baldwin's, uh, I believe all four, you know, Stephen Baldwin was converted to Christianity by his Mexican housemate or his Filipino housemate or whatever, and supposedly. And I don't, you know, it is it is what it is. And I guess those brothers who make the, these movies, Fireproof and so on, yes, they are essentially, you know, very cliched, but... Uh, and yes, they are, you know, they are what they are. It's not very original. It's, you know, you know, it's, it's like I said, like he's, he's essentially correct in his initial assessment, but what he falls short of is asking, what do we want to come out of Hollywood? And, uh, that's where these alt-rightists always fall short because they present a critique without, Uh, expressing any goals and they do this on purpose because they do not want to foster any sort of art or culture because if they did they'd be out of a job because their job is to critique the is to offer a critique of the left-wing liberal culture contemporary culture they don't want to see its antithesis come to be so that's that like i said we we don't know what we want we know what we don't want, and that's what uh, that's what um, the whole point of the culture is, and that's why you know Black House Rock didn't sell very many copies, even among the alt right. It's not because it was weird or unusual or anything like that. It's because they didn't they do not like any right rightist artist or cultural figures because we represent the end of their paycheck. And that's why what? you know James O'Mara was the only one to inter- to uh, really uh, review the book. We didn't get a single review from Spencer's 
deal or from you know any any other alt right sources. I know there's this whole sort of a genre of I guess you could say sort of alt right despair con. Uh, there's uh, Andy Nowicki, Ann Sterzinger, uh, writers like that who are similar, and also your writings as well. And they write well, about a lot of the same my, themes. I don't consider my writing despair con though. See, there's a lot of despair con, and it's like porn for oh, alt writers. I think yeah. that term. I think when James O'Mara reviewed the poet and the cat, I think he was the one who, t- who coined that alt right despair con. Did he review the poet and the cat? I would much like to see that review. Yeah, he did. Well, you, you need to send me the link because I would like to see that. Because honestly, Robert, uh, not to flatter you, but that your uh, your uh, representation of that play or your depiction of that play is really growing on me. And I say this as somebody who sits around and drinks wine with a cat a lot of the time. <laughs> so. Well, the thing about the thing about the poet and the cat is you were you were the right. I mean, you wrote it. So it's your, it really captures like your writing style. But I basically came up with the general concept. Well, you did, not only did you do that, you you produced and created. You put it on the screen. You know, not to not to, like I said, just to um, you the I'm talking about the actual your actual um, video of it or your actual yeah, movie. Yeah, directing you know, your production, your production. Yeah, everything acting. you did is what. It's growing on me. It's I I do consider it your baby, and that's what you know. I wrote that when I was drunk, and you know, uh, you know, bit um, broken down, and you know, just uh, just out of it, you know, and uh, and uh, you know, in the middle of the night, and uh, you know, but it was it's you know it's yours, and that's uh, like I said, um, I I really uh, I really like your production of it honestly it's grown on me at first I, I couldn't stand it but you know it's grown on me well thanks I appreciate that that's just a theme would you say there's a theme also a lot of writers who write about the theme of kind of a nihilism and misanthropy well we're just all manic we're all manic depressives I think yeah. uh, Nowicki is, is probably the least manic depressive that's why he's the most prolific and Anne is a I, wonderful writer. <clears throat> Sorry, go ahead. Also, I think Nowicki is because uh, Nowicki is very, he has his faith. I think of someone, yes. the combination of of being aware of things and, and, not, and being secular would drive someone to total nihilism and uh, misanthropy. Well, I'm a Christian as well. I'm not a Catholic, and sometimes I regret that, but uh you know it is you know absolutely true that faith helps there's a lot of things that help you know uh but in the last analysis um you know i would say andy manages everything the best uh i don't consider my work to be again despair stuff it's black humor it's i've always found that in the worst situations in the most um in the most, you know, worst, you know, life-threatening, despicable, whatever, there's some humor to be found. And uh, that's where I'm going with that, you know, with a lot of my stuff is there's always uh, there's always a little bit of humor and there's always a little bit of class because when I say class, I mean people acting with class, which you don't see much anymore because, you know, honor and dignity and bravery you don't see that much in contemporary society and which criminalizes such behavior and therefore I don't see the actions of most of my characters as nihilistic I see it as them willing to pay the price for demonstrating the qualities they have you know and uh, that's you know Tom Metzger was asked well you know once where the uh the you know the heroic white men are and he said they're all in jail and you know there's there's more than a grain of truth to that you you know if if you have certain qualities you're going to end up in jail you know and or you're going to end up dead there's no two ways around it you know in this society criminalizes certain types of behavior or you're going to have to hide out in the woods or something you know in any case like I said I don't view 
the actions of my characters as nihilistic. I, I just see them as being willing to pay the price of their actions, which is often death or, you know, which is always death, as a matter of fact, you know, or whatever, you know. It's a little different in Black House Rocked because the character's a vampire or whatever, something. <laughs> yeah, I know I have a friend who, he, he kind of describes himself as a nihilist, but I don't think his description is accurate because he's actually in some ways very moralistic, but he views society as a completely worthless. Well, I don't see society as completely worthless, and uh, I was going to get to this, but we'll come back to it. But um, one thing I've been doing when I, while I drink is uh, read Taylor Caldwell, and she has been an influence on me for many years. And that's a name that you will never hear on the alt right because the alt right does not foster, does not like to talk about culture at all. They want to whine about whatever is contemporary, like is. Islamic shootings or whatever. I don't even pay attention to the news. But anyway, Taylor Caldwell has a very meta aspect to her fiction. And uh, she wrote historical fiction for the most part. And what's interesting is that in a lot of societies, in every historical epoch, people considered, you know, society to be pretty much worthless. I mean, go back to... uh, Dostoevsky, you know, I mean, if Dostoevsky wrote the book on nihilism, you know, I mean. Well, I think you have an excellent point because a lot of people on the alt right kind of act as if things were going great throughout history, and that a lot of these problems are purely recent phenomenons. But a lot of the a lot of these issues are part of the human condition. Yeah, and again, with Taylor Caldwell, Taylor Caldwell was farther right you know, than most people will ever be, you know, and uh, on the alt-right or whatever. But she had a very meta aspect to her fiction that, you know, like I said, she uh, she, had, she had a great historical awareness in her, in her fiction that, you know, these characters are, are more advanced in looking at the world or she depicts the characters as looking at the world you know, this is not the greatest time ever. You know, look at Cicero. You know, Cicero, everything the alt-right's ever said, Cicero said before them when complaining about Rome, you know? So, and Cicero has the same a- aspect. And Cicero is perhaps the uh, the most um, accurate fiction, you know, accurate figure uh, to represent the modern alt-rightist. He's a guy who you know, it's not the, uh, except, you know, he died with honor. And, uh, you know, your average alt-rightist is never going to die with honor. But Cicero spent his life complaining about how things were. But, you know, he died or he or put everything on the line to make them, to change them for his beloved republic and his constitution and all that. And, uh, you, you know, unlike, uh, you know, your average alt-rightist who's never going to even miss a meal to, uh, you know, to do anything about that. But so, Cicero, but other than that, you know, Cicero spent years complaining and, you know, is, you know, not doing anything constructive necessarily that would endanger his interests. But finally he, you know, spent the last years of his life, you know, at least trying to change that, you know, you know back and forth. You know, it's a good depiction of him in the TV series Rome. You know, he's not the bravest guy in the world, but at least he dies with honor, you know. And uh, the, the the idea of dying with honor is something that I deeply try to convey in my work, and that's something that is never may have never come across well. I guess that di- death with honor. You know, I, I I post a lot about Yukio Mishima and other figures like that, and death with honor is a huge something that is a huge part of you know, culture and and the right and uh, just the whole concept is something that uh, that needs to be more front and center in many ways. It's it well, has a lot to do with poetry too. People in uh, society today, they're, they're sort of this idea, a kind of not not accepting death. So 
that's sort of the last thing on people's mind, the idea that they're going to live to, like, an old age and not think about dying at all. Yes, that's something else, like I said, that's misinterpreted in my works, because I don't consider them that dark. I'm just considering these people, death is not the worst thing in the world to these people. You know, it's not the end of the world, and it may come across as, you know, to me, I've tried to cultivate that attitude in life, and so when I wrote these stories, and when I wrote, uh, when I wrote my first collection of stories, you know, I I had, uh, I, you know, I was recovering from a, you know, near-death accident. And, uh, you know, uh, that was, you know, it was something that was on my mind, obviously, but it wasn't, you know, it wasn't the worst thing ever, you know, to me. And so I just wrote the stories kind of, it, I wasn't feeling terrible about it, but it was something that, the character should embrace because that's part of life and it's part of honor and dying with honor like i said is something that nobody really wants to think about you know and especially the whole concept of death is something that's very important to the right in general it just is that's what the thing about militant islam that everybody puts down which is actually the noblest part of islam is the idea of dying for something, dying for your religion, dying for your family, dying for your clan, dying for your country. This is not something, this is very un-American. Um, it's a very un-American idea because Americans don't like to die. So. Yeah, I think with the with the critique of Islam, uh, the neocon critique of Islam is, they criticize Islam from sort of a, a values of the of the left, they reject. They say that Islam rejects liberal values. Some people, I guess, on the like the traditionalist right, their attitude is that they 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 will, they'll basically say what you're saying is that Muslims are willing to die for something greater, and that the West is decadent. But the same, but they're still they still see Islam as an invading hostile army. Well, I see. My honest appraisal of Islam right now, and here's one of the things that we've talked about culture, by the way, and what I would really like to see in America is a is a uh, some good translations of Saddam Hussein's novels because I would really like to read them and I'd like to see them available. And there's a lot of work of fiction and poetry that have been produced by all the years of bloodshed and violence in the Middle East that is not not, not available in the Western world, that, and I think that's a travesty, honestly, because uh, I think that that is where, you know, I think the spirits move us at times and places, and the spirits are usually where poetry usually comes out of bloodshed. So I think America being devoid of culture and devoid of art and devoid of all this, the art, the spirits have moved from America to the Middle East, and that's where the poetry and the art is coming out of right now. And that's And I would rather read Saddam Hussein's novel than, you know, anything else that's come out, you know, this year, you know, that's, that's, that would be the book, the work of fiction that interested me the most, you know, even though it's been, you know, he's been dead for a few years and the book's been out for, been a bestseller in them. I'm sure it's fairly easy to get an Arabic copy of Saddam's work. I'm sure you could find like an Arabic translator who could do that. Yeah, I mean, but I would like to see it widespread. I would like to see it be uh, available in bookstores in the United States, is what I'm saying. I mean, you know, yeah, you can get a copy of my book, too, but, you know, unless it's a little more accessible to people, most people won't, you know? Well, obviously you haven't read it because you can't speak, uh, read or speak Arabic, but do you have any ideas of what his work is about? Well, I was just generalizing with... Uh, he wrote a book about a, a guy who's fights off an invader in his land and, you know, that kind of thing. It was, uh, it's been a few years since I've considered it, but where I'm just going with that is that Islam is the only true form of right and culture in this in this world that's relatively, that's still fighting against the forces that be, the powers that be today. It's the only insurgent culture and force of the right in this world. Every other uh you know, there's no um, genuine right, you know, to the to the you know as the antithesis to the left, except the Islamic uh, 
the Islamic State and, uh, you know, a few other deals like this. You know, uh, everything you hear about ISIS is about what they said about the Nazis and is mostly untrue. So I, I it, it, you know, I just kind of let it walk, pass over my back because, you know, uh, oh, yes, they're raping babies. And Geronimo was tossing babies into the air and, and uh, catching them on his spear point or whatever back in the day. And, you know, all these stories were untrue, you know. Yes, everybody commits a massacre now, now and again, but mostly, including the Indian massacres, were lar- you know all that all those stories were largely to uh, allow uh, allow the U.S. Um, military and other you know forces like that to commit genocide, which is a liberal value uh, against you know different you know groups, but you know the Apache and so on. Yes, the Apache w- would torture man and do this and that, but they didn't do it as a you know, they didn't kill babies and stuff like that. And they say the same thing about ISIS and Saddam and, you know, every group. And it's just, it's just gives them a reason to kill the babies of their, uh, it gives the U.S. a reason to kill the babies of their enemies. So, you know, that's the the reason. So one thing is the use of humor and especially dark humor. Uh, can you give some examples of how to use uh, humor to be uh, subversive? Uh, I don't believe in being subversive. Uh, I use the humor. I just want to depict the humor. I want to show that it exists, and I want to show how it exists, and I want to show, you know, it's like, um, it's like, uh, well, when these, uh, you know, it's like black humor. When you're being tortured, you you quote poetry or you make a joke or something, you know. That's and it shows it shows courage and gallantry and and all that. It's not about I don't really believe in being subversive. I don't want to subvert the system or anything like that. I don't have any desire to subvert the system. That's that's all. That's you know. That's if you hear somebody talking about that, they are essentially uh, some form of leftist because you know I'm just not into that. You know that's. But in terms of using black humor, what the real purpose of it is, I think Dominic Benner. Uh, wrote something about that but it's just that's just the way brave people are they will use humor in the darkest of moments you know to show that's just the human condition that's the way a brave man acts or a man of honor acts in extremities uh one thing that you've talked about is you have this uh, concept uh generation maggot Generation faggot. Generation faggot is what you call millennials, basically us. You're you're basically exactly one year older than I am. You were born in '84. I was born in '85. Generation uh, maggot is what you describe uh, like teenagers to. I guess people under teenagers today, maybe people like who were people born since the late '90s. There's a lot of discussion about like the generation, like baby boomers, generation X versus millennials, but there's not so much discussion about generation maggot, which you coined. What do you see as a key difference between uh, the, our generation and generation maggot? They have much less and they're much poorer and they're much more culturally sterile, but at the same time, they have more opportunities in some ways. In some ways, uh, Generation Faggot has tried to afford it, its progeny some of the cultural opportunities that they were bereft of. So you will see, you know, some of uh, Generation Maggot that can play beautifully on the cello and have certain other, you know, musical qualities, but. At the same time, the reason I call it maggot is because even when they have these musical and talented abilities, you will see that they're fundamentally dead forms of expression. Because you will see, for example, these kid rock bands. There are a lot of uh, there are a lot of uh, junior rock bands made up of all 13-year-olds, and their parents will put them together, and you know they go to battles of the bands, and, and it's it's essentially a sterile form of rock and roll because they'll play and they'll practice and they'll, you know, they'll do their music, but they'll never write any great rock songs or they'll never create any great 
guitar solos or, or or do anything like that. And we've we know this because it's been about ten years going on, and not a single interesting band has emerged in that time um, over the last well, ten most, years. Most you know? of the major musicians today, uh, they're basically over the age of twenty, so they're basic. I'd say they're more like generation or millennials, basically. I mean, the generation you're talking about, Generation Maggot, they're basically still I'm talking, kids. So. I'm talking about 13 and 14 year olds right now here, but honestly, we can we can look forward 10 years or five years and see they're not going to produce anything of value with their instrumentals. They can be they're very talented, but they're essentially become like Asians who can be very good at many things, but cannot be original at any of them. They can master forms, many forms of expression, but you're you're rarely going to hear anything about great Asian novelists or great this and great that. The beauty, half of the beauty of Mishima and certain Japanese novels, novelists, is that they wrote beautifully in their own language, which sometimes transfers to English well, and sometimes it doesn't. But you take an Asian American novelist, and you know you never know. One never knows. Oh, so you're um, talking about. Asian Americans, you're not talking about like Japan per se. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm talking about people. what I'm saying is that Generation Maggot is like Asian Amer- are like Asian Americans who master art forms. You know, they send their kids to do to school and they do very well, or they send them to uh, you know play in orchestras and stuff. But their their kids never produce any. You know, symphonies. They never, they're never going to rival Beethoven, or they're never going to create works of art themselves. You know, they may play, uh, they may be able to play Beethoven, but they're never going to surpass him writing music like him. As far as like uh, eras in music, uh, in general, in generally, I'm not taught. Well, you, you, there's sort of like uh, alternative music, but as far as like uh, mainstream. Uh, rock and pop music. What do you see as the last decade that's produced a great music and culture? The last decade? Uh, probably be yeah. the 80s. Agno- Agnostic writes a lot about this. Agnostic, uh, at, you know, Akino Kier, uh, you, you're probably familiar with his work. Agnostic. You know what I'm talking yeah. about? Yeah, you know, and, you know, he's, of course, completely ignored by the alternative right because of what he writes, because what he he writes a great deal about culture and music and so on, and he gets ignored because, you know, what he talks about is not necessarily with the party line, but, you know, what he writes about 80s, the 80s was a time when people were still, had some hope. Generation faggot kind of... uh gave up on hope and generation maggot is the maggots crawling on the open wounds and the the uh dead corpses you know that's that's what's left you know the aids um like everybody in this generation pretty much has aids they act like an aids patient that's where i got generation faggot from because they all act like they're hiv positive they all act apathetic they're kind of scrawny the the you know there are a lot of guys like andrew sullivan who you know lifts weights and he's HIV positive, but he's still, you know, Andrew Sullivan, you know, and what has Andrew Sullivan ever produced ever, you know? So, uh, my point is, is that that's where the concept comes from. And the eighties was unique in the sense that it was an era where there were, there was, it was, things were starting to change, but there was still sort of a remnant of the, Older America left. You saw kind of the conflict of both worlds. Yes, uh, at the time you had, uh, oh, I think G. William Donoff or whoever it was complaining about the 500 families. And that was cool. At the time you had 500 families. Now you got, what, 12 running everything? I would rather the country was run by 500 families than 12, you know? If uh, if uh, if I had my choice, you know, I would rather go back to that time, you know, when there was that much, you know, better to be 5,000 families running the country than 12, you know. Anything's better than 12. But And that's, of course, something else that you will never hear talked about. You know, that's that's a salient point. You got, you're, we're down to 12, 
you know, 12, uh, being ruled by 12 bloods. And, you know, at one time you had up to 500 people, 500 families, you know, in the, in the best, uh, best people's book or whatever, you know, that you could, uh, you know, complain about, you know, all these white privileged people, 500 white privileged families are running the country and, you know, in 1981 or whatever. And it was something you could complain about, you know, poverty, everything is blame on these 500 white privileged families. Well, now we're down to 12 and they're, you know, they, they may be white or they may be Jewish or they may be reptilian, you know, I don't know, but uh, I don't particularly well, care. But the point is at the time, yeah, go ahead. Media conglomerates and like in early eighties, there was maybe about like, uh, I don't know. I forget the number anywhere from like 30 to 70 media companies. Now media is owned by like four, four, basically four different companies. Yeah, and it's a cycle as well. It'll, it'll, it will be changed. I mean, they were down to a handful of newspapers more than once. So I fully expect the cycle to work its way around. But the point is, yeah, in the 80s, there was the, the, the wider the range, the more room for opportunity for other people. And of course, Reagan was there. And, you know, there were a lot of, uh, there were a lot of, you know, the world was a different place and people didn't, you know, people had, there was more opportunity anywhere you cut it, you know. <clears throat> I mean, here's the, here's the salient point again, is that people, there was a wider range from which people could rise from. People could rise from complete poverty to some level of affluence in the 80s. Today, Everybody is the the world is more socialist in that everybody is more flat. You know the playing field is more level, but there's nowhere you can rise to. You know, there was a time in the 80s when you could rise from your station to a better station. Nowadays, you know you can go up a little bit. The grade is about 12 percent, but you know you can climb that little grade, but you're never going to be much above where you are. Well, my greatest beef with the 80s was it was essentially a very um, it was very weak in some ways. It was very soft. That would be my greatest uh, criti- critique of the 80s. What do you see as some of the most uh, innovative uh, musicians that came out of that era? Well, I think Prince was one of the most innovative musicians of that age, of that era. I think Guns N' Roses was another one uh, that really uh, set the decade on its ass. Uh, you know, probably could come up with some more talented musicians, but those are certainly two big ones that had enormous influence and were very, very good. I mean, you you look at somebody like Prince and compare him to the modern R&B figures that can't play an instrument, you know, they often lip sync, and they don't draw the crowds and have the energy that Prince had. You know, we're talking about, you know, right now R&B is huge. The whites are trying to copy the blacks again and you know we have so let's just that's why i'm focusing on prince here and yet they just don't have the energy the music is lackluster it's tired it feels tired the music feels very tired and weak and and all lights do is make it feel more tired and weak and then we go back to prince and this guy has so much energy and so much force and his concerts are so electric compared to anything today and like i said we're just looking at this from our perspective and that there are a lot of black r&b performers today and there are a lot of white performers in many genres including country and western and others that try to copy that r&b vibe and they fail completely you're talking about r&b one thing i've noticed about like if you look at rap if you look at rap music originally rap music was about like uh, criminal culture and uh, disrespecting uh, society, and uh, basically the last since basically since like the end of the nineties, it's been pretty much about hedonism, like bitches and hoes. Well, I like Tupac, and I liked him since uh, the movie Bullet, and you know i think uh i think whites really liked that movie that came out what was the group public enemy or whatever but uh rap is in many ways overrated i remember uh 
uh, G.G. Allen wrote an article many years ago, and this, this is very obscure, but sometime you're going to have to interview Alan King. Because Alan King was, you know, Alan, the goddamn King, um, was a, it was and is quite a musician and a figure that, you know, you want to interview. But anyway, he had a magazine for a while, and G.G. Allen wrote an article in it called Ice Tea's Cop Out in which he takes Ice T to task for wimping out on his songs about killing cops. And my point is that, you know, from the beginning, the rappers, once they Ironically, came off the street... Uh, Ice T actually ended up playing a cop on the show on order. Yeah, and what where I'm going with this is that once the rappers came off the streets, they ended up running into... Uh, these Jewish producers like, uh, oh, what's that guy who, uh, Rick, uh, oh, I can't think of his name. He produced Johnny Cash's uh, last album, but I can't think of his name. But he did a lot of, uh, he started out doing a lot of rap. Uh, anyway, uh, the point what? is, is they guided oh, these rappers. They guided these rappers and told them, oh, you got to do this. You got to, you got to compromise here. And, the rappers were more than happy to compromise. They never even thought of the, the concept of selling out does not exist in hip hop because hip hop is all about selling out and it always has been. You know, it's never been uh, about you know you know the certain you know certain genres of music like certain types of country where they they write whole albums about not selling out to the machine or the establishment. Well, rap's always been about selling out. So Ice T, you know, fell all over himself to uh, Rick Rubin. That's his name. Thank you, Dave. Oh yeah. yeah. Um, but anyway, they fell all over themselves to to sell out from the beginning. And you had a guy like Gigi Allen who never, who never, uh, who never sold out. And you know, he's kind of like an underground legendary figure now. And, you know. And uh, so, but he wrote this article back in 1991 um, when rap was supposedly supposedly more gangster and you know out there, and uh, criticizing them for that. So, what I'm saying is, like I said um, from the beginning, hip hop rap has been about selling out, and how quickly you can sell out, and how and once you sell out, of course, then you you know your producer's going to tell you what to do and how to do it, and he's going to tell you if you offend somebody, you got to apologize and so on and so forth, you know. One more comment I'll make is I know uh, there was this sort of genre of angry rock in the 90s, mm -hmm. and then that, after Columbine happened, I noticed uh, there was sort of a, a lot of uh, journalists were speculating that Columbine actually kind of killed that genre. Uh, like Rage Against the Machine and stuff. And Nine Inch Nails and uh, Rammstein. I honestly couldn't comment on that. I kind of see all that as Generation Faggot, and there is a certain aspect of Generation Faggot that I've never written about that is ironic faggotry, which is kind of like um, there's a certain kind of faggotry or gay behavior that annoys contemporary liberal values, and this is what James O'Mara writes about a lot. Um, is the The there are certain kinds of acceptable homosexuality, and there are certain kinds of homosexuality that's not acceptable. And Rom is Romstein is the unacceptable homosexuality. You know, <laughs> the narcissism, the the bodybuilding, the the worship of strength and and beauty, especially when it's white um, oriented or European oriented. They don't like that at all. And uh, also, so, yeah, there is. Gay culture has become kind of more uh, sterilized. Uh, in the 70s and 80s, when it was kind of uh, stigmatized, like stuff like being a tranny or homosexual was seen as edgy because it was kind of, there was like a seedy aspect of this. But today being homosexual is part, it's kind of tied in with the mainstream kind of suburban uh, pop culture. And that's something well, that I probably think, James Romero would write about. I think it's pres I think it's presented that way. I think I think um, I think it's presented as suburban just to make people comfortable with it. But I think in reality, you know, the gay lifestyle hasn't changed at all. It's it's just as sad, honestly, as it ever was for the most part. You know, of course, 
you know, I mean, you you know, you're going to run into as many depressives and unhappy, you know, unhappy um, gay people or couples that fight, you know. There's a certain part of the, the whole culture where gays really want to adapt to whatever. The uh, Gays are very um, desirous of stepping to whatever tune the media calls, whatever tune the piper calls. So they're, well, they they want to accommodate Mar- themselves to the culture. theory is that he sees homosexuals as being the innovators and creators of culture. I think there's some truth to that, but I've always, and I was just using this example the other day, I've always seen that it's two ways. Uh, if you've ever read John Huston's biography, he has this very interesting anecdote about uh, filming the night of the iguana with Tennessee Williams. I believe it was the night of the iguana. And Tennessee Williams, of course, was Tennessee Williams. Now, John Huston may not be as well known as Tennessee Williams, but Tennis- John Huston was a very heterosexual man. And he ventured a criticism of Tennessee Williams' work of his original play, kind of like... Um, you know, uh, Tennessee Williams wrote the play, but John Huston is is actually producing it, making a movie of it, and he basically tells Tennessee Williams, you know, you are a gay man writing about this heterosexual couple, and that's not the way it actually is. You know, you're 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 taking a very uh, gay way of looking at this, and I'm, what I'm saying is that he he told Tennessee Williams to his face. You know, this is not the way it's going to be. And, you know, it's not the way... The way you present it is not real because you're a gay man. And he said, says this to his face because John Houston is a very heterosexual man and yet he is very creative and he's very he's very attuned to, to the, uh, you know, the dynamics. In other words, he has kind of a a gay way of, he has a gay, um, he has a way of viewing things from a a gay perspective, but he's not gay. And he can tell Tennessee Williams, who can't view things from a heterosexual perspective, you know, this is the way it's going to be because you're wrong here, you know. He has that ability, you know, that sensitivity, that creativity. So what I'm saying here, and this is all, you can find this story in Houston's memoirs, but what I'm saying here is that an extremely heterosexual person can have that sensitivity and create creativity as a gay man does too. And we do not cultivate extreme heterosexual heterosexuality in our culture. So I'm just saying it works two ways. You know, you have to go sometimes. Uh, I'm not saying James is wrong. I'm just saying it is also possible to be extremely heterosexual and do the same things and foster the same talents. One uh, trend you pointed out a while back, I remember on Facebook, is the wiggerification of rednecks. And I, when, at the time, I, when you brought it up, I obviously where I live, there's not, it's not super redneck, it's California. But when I visited Vegas, I saw there were a lot of working class uh, tourists from the south visiting. I definitely noticed that trend. Also with a lot of the, like, advertisements for performers in Vegas, like a lot of the uh, newer country stars you see. I do notice that trend. Uh, can you talk about your observations on that uh, in the South? Well, I talked about country performers chasing the R&B trends, and this is something Trigger Man over at uh, SavingCountryMusic.com writes about a lot, actually, and he's not, he is one of the uh, the least biased journalists on this. Um, least biased journalist out there. He's not a he's not affiliated. I, I think like you, he is one of the few really independent minded journalists out there that writes about things and like I said, he has written extensively about this trend from a totally n- you know, non racialist point of view and just pointing out that it's corrupting the genre and it's creating garbage, you know. Uh because you have this whole deal with the flat billed caps and now with square toed boots and so on and you have you know, I would I wouldn't mind seeing certain rappers do country albums and, and there's certain rappers who've talked about doing country albums and I think, you know, there's certain rappers who've co- corroborated with Willie Nelson. Willie Nelson will sing with anybody. But getting to the point here, 
what we're we're seeing is that the country is chasing trends. You know, Dolly Parton did it in the 80s. Uh, Shania Twain did it in the, uh, whatever her name is, did it in the uh, 90s, copying the Coors, Irish band. Uh, you know, uh, whenever a, a art form becomes kind of stale, you know, they start copying whatever's black music is contemporary. You know, country music... Uh, Hank Williams, uh, one music journal or journalist, uh, observed that Hank Williams was the first wigger in some ways because what he did was he took blues and put it into country. But Hank Williams stayed very... Cl- and he also brought the steel guitar into country, and a lot of people hated him for that. Grandpa Jones, a lot of those old country people. But the difference between Hank Williams and the modern country singers is that Hank Williams crafted these songs that were really very good <laughs> and they had lots of instrumentals on them and they had uh, you know the songs meant something to people these songs are forgotten as quickly as they come out you know and moreover Hank Williams stayed very close to the country roots he had he dressed a certain way you know the drifting cowboy band they were very culturally there you know he he drew heavily same with Elvis they drew from the blues the black music but they were very they stayed very culturally within their own you know their own genres their own they were they were their own people it's possible to draw from influences and honestly i don't see any modern influences country needs to draw from right now but you know it is possible to draw off from other genres and not you know, not great total garbage, which is what's happened, you know. Um, the reason, the main reason one they thing, want to draw from... One thing I think the, about uh, both rap and country, which is interesting, is if, well, first of all, with rap, the early rappers, a lot of them grew up, like, in the projects in the Bronx or in South Central L.A. I think a lot of the younger uh, younger rappers grew up from kind of, like, middle, fairly middle-class backgrounds, or maybe their mother was, like, a a black public employee and they lived in maybe sort of a middle class suburb. And then with country music, the early country music stars grew up in actually they actually grew up in the country. I think a lot of newer country music stars are from places like the suburbs of a uh, like suburban Dallas and places or suburban or suburban cities, maybe like uh, suburban Nashville. Well yeah, that's the other part of Generation Maggot. There is no They've never had a chance to do anything. Um, you know, that's the worst part of both maggot and faggot. Fa- uh, faggot won't, maggot can't. Faggot won't do anything. Maggot will never have the opportunity to do anything, to do anything interesting or extraordinary or have experiences in life that will enable to do them to do that. You know, American Idol, you know, you get to be 20 years old, you got a half decent voice, you got blonde hair, you you get a singing contract, you know? Uh you know, it's not about the space of time you spend doing something. It's Hank Williams died when he was 29, but he had lots of experiences and he wrote all those songs, you know? I mean, we could take away Luke the Drifter and all his gospel songs and just deal with his regular songs and he still was a very prolific writer in his nine years or ten years of professional uh, career. And uh, on the other hand, you know, we, we, uh, we go to the modern singers and they don't have a chance to live life at all. Subur- suburban life is no life at all. So they never have a chance to have experiences or meet people or find stories, create art. And so they borrow and they borrow from other genres, and, you know, that's why that's the essence of the sterility. That's why, you know, to these kids, sometimes they they encounter rap, you know, when they grew up around country, and they say, wow, this is really original, I'm going to try this, you know, because they grew up in a white environment, not familiar with rap, and so they start incorporating the rap in because it seems original to them. And so, you know, they create that whole aspect of it but it's you know it's we, not actually original you mentioned the, the film uh winter uh bone 
which actually takes place in the Ozarks where your book took place, uh, it sort of has that same uh, theme of a uh, Southern Gothic. Did that film yeah, have an influence on your work? Uh, I've never seen it, and I haven't read the book, but I wanted to uh, I wanted to take some shots at Daniel Woodrow. He lives over in West Plains, Missouri, and uh, West Plains is and that part of Missouri is like the land God forgot, and it's a very what he writes is I consider you know it's it's it is what it is, but I think he's like me, but without the humor, and you have to have that humor to really have any life. You know, you you know that's the whole thing about uh, writing about white people. You you he he writes with about you know if I was if I was you know um you know I don't I have a percentage of white in me, but if I was which allows me to write the way I do, but if I was fully white, I would never be able to write because he writes completely without any life. He tells that story. It's it's you know it's largely a, a, a semi-realistic story, but he tells it without any life and out, without any humor, and that's because he's devoid of ethnos and he's writing about people largely devoid of ethnos. And you know it's not easy. You literally have to choke a story out of the Ozarks, but it's possible to do. You know you have to grab it with both hands and wring the story out, but and, but it's possible to do it and. The thing about Winter's Bone, like I said, is it's got that whole, you know, the, the main reason is um, Hollywood made the movie is to make fun of white people who live in the Ozarks because you're not going to see that true natural ethnic humor or that black humor or whatever, or that class, you know, when I see class, I mean honor, you know, rising, and, and you can find it in any people anywhere. But the reason Hollywood accepts Daniel Woodrow um, is because, he has that weary, weariness and despair emanating from his works, and uh, that's that would be my criticism of of Winter's Bone. I have read Woodrow, and I know quite a lot about him. Like I said, he doesn't live too terribly far from me, about an hour and a half, I guess. But you know, I've, I'm very familiar with the country and the people that he writes about, even more familiar than him, because I travel through the Ozarks more than he does, and uh, and so I see more than he does in many ways, and I um, travel to the rest of the country more often as well. So I, I really have a better perspective than most people who are more static. And I also see more of the country, different aspects, up and upper and lower class than most people do. Most people are, you know, are in one specific section of the country or see one specific class of people, you know, so... There, that's where I think his perspective is very skewed as well. Yeah, I mean, the most interesting people have actually been in different uh, classes. They've they've been rich and poor. I think if you've been stuck in one class your whole life, then you're gonna have you're not gonna understand the way the world works. You have to see both sides. And the other thing about Woodrow is that he wants very hard to be a contemporary academic NPR type writer but he's confronted by the reality of what he's dealing with, which is so not NPR, uh, community college writing, you know, kind of deal anymore. And he's having to, you know, fight against that whole part of his work. So it is a struggle for him as well. So, Paul Bingham, it's been an excellent show. Uh, thanks for being on. I enjoyed myself, Robert, and I appreciate you having me on. <laughs> Uh, thanks again. Uh, that's all we have for today's show, uh, so take care, and we'll be back with you next time. Long live death.